actually, I was going to say this is more for, you know, me as a director, but it's it I think it applies to actors, too. Another filmmaker once said to me, you have to be kind of naive to be a filmmaker in the sense like you have to believe like I just had to be completely naive and like believe I was going to make a film and like believe that my film was going to get made. And I think it's the same as an actor. You have to believe you're going to be an actor. Hello. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Uh, Hi, guys. Hi. Uh, this is Jamie Jack and Jonathan Tucker. Give them a round of applause for Palm Trees and Power Lines. How's everybody doing? What a film, right? Um, this film won honors at Sundance and uh, Toronto Film Festival and is currently up for Film Independent Spirit Awards. Congratulations to you both on the many accolades for this film. Thanks. More to come. Um, we got to start with the big basic question. Uh, tell us, Jamie, about the journey of this film. I know that there are those in the audience who are curious to know about its evolution from a short film to now. Um, yeah, so this started as Palm Trees and Power Lines, the short film, and um, I made that in 2017, I believe. Um, and it was kind of, of, you know, it was like a validating experience for me having audience members watch that short, whether it was on the festival circuit or once it premiered online, and kind of share with me their experiences and um, how they identified with the story. And so that kind of um, made me realize that I, there was more I wanted to explore here, and I began adapting it into a feature. And I was going to say this for later, but how did the Me Too movement affect the adaptation into the feature length? Yeah, I, um, I would say that at first when I started writing, um, it kind of just dealt with a like kind of an inappropriate age gap relationship. Um, and I wrote many drafts of it like that. Um, and then the script wasn't exactly what I wanted it to be. And this was around the time of Me Too. And I never really think about it, but I guess it did affect me. Um, I then started, you know, wanting to write it more to follow the stages of grooming. And that was how I wrote the script and how the story is told. Um, so, yeah, that defi definitely did affect me. Wonderful. And Jonathan, how did you get involved? I always love asking people like actors, what, what do you remember about your first impressions of reading the script for the first time? Um, well, uh, <clears throat> I loved the script. I thought it was um, uncompromising and spoke to this idea that, I mean, I have th two three-and-a-half-year-old twins, so I certainly understand wanting to go to a movie and just, or turning on TV and just getting into like a warm bath. I totally get it. Um, but I also don't want to go to movies just to be told what I already believe. And um, I found the script to be... Uh, real, you know, kind of punch to the face. And the the script felt, I felt like it groomed me because my intuition was telling me things repeatedly. Uh, warning signs were going up about this guy and about this relationship. And, and I, I know it's not right, but you're kind of wanting to root for it. But you're like, I'm sure it's okay because at every time... You think this? There's a real problem. The script and Jamie, and then the film. You know, it, it, she does it in the film as well, so beautifully. There's just enough to make you feel like, okay, I'll keep moving forward. I'll keep trying to buy into this, which makes obviously the ending so devastating, um, because you knew you were wrong. And it's always I, I love coming to these screenings here um, at SAG, after because you know as actors. Um, you appreciate in a really smart, sophisticated, curious way um, what intuition is and how important it is in the work that we do and listening to it and, and how much, how hard, how, where the, the, the distance between your intuition and the choices you make is ultimately going to determine your success and the magic of the work that we do. So um, in many ways, that first read really spoke to all of that. Um, and then I can say with a bit of hubris that I knew the moment Jamie started talking that she was, um, you know, the real deal. 
and that there was a possibility I'd be getting in kind of at the ground level um, with this extraordinary woman. And I love this idea that um, you just described, like the idea of um, rooting for this or rooting for the character. Like, first of all, is that first reading of the script something that you as an actor are then trying, and you as a director too, are trying to recreate? You're trying to recreate your feeling of experiencing the story for the first time, but getting us to experience it for the first time. <laughs> well, I mean, the, the process for the actor, I mean, it's always exciting for the first read, and every script is a new potential, which is what makes being in the business for so long kind of constantly exciting. Like Every time you get this script, it could be, it could be the greatest thing you've ever read. You know, what a privilege because like every, all these other businesses you go to, all these other jobs, you, some of you might work these other jobs. It's like, you don't get this extraordinary potential with page one. Um, and so this, you know, and you're always hoping as it's, as it's magnificent, you're hoping it continues to be magnificent. And Jamie's um, script certainly was that. Um, but then you need to allow everything on the day to um, kind of bring... Uh, to, you have to be open to it. So you do all that work in pre-production and you build this extraordinary kind of game plan and and then you, you you go to war and you have to breathe and you gotta see the world and, and be excited about all of the, the things that happened that you weren't expecting. Uh, it's like summing up the life of an actor for this room full of actors. So but that's also, I mean, that, so that, that's, that's, that was really J Jamie, I mean, that was one of the first conversations that we had and Maybe you can speak a little bit about both the visual and the spiritual kind of framework that you provided. I'm now doing the Q&A, apparently. Oh, absolutely. Yes, of course. <laughs> but also, I just want to say to your question, you know, it was like striking a delicate balance between these two actors being super comfortable with one another for the scenes that required that, for these really kind of intense and intimate scenes. But then also, you know, them getting to know one another and... Um, you know, I remember like saying to you guys at one point because we had all become so close and we were, you know, we didn't have the luxury of shooting in order. So I was like, guys, separate to like other, you know, to the opposite ends of his truck. You don't know each other now, you know, you don't know each other well. So it was like kind of tracking that through the whole process. I mean, what you want out of a director is like a guardrail. You know, you want to be able to go so big or you want to fail so badly or you want to throw out just choices that fundamentally might not work knowing and trusting that your director will put up, um, you know, some sort of, a, um, you know, a frame, literally, that you can know what your marks are, that you can play within, and then, you know, the spiritual quality so that when you end up scoring it, um, you know, in the edit, ultimately the things that you, you know, the magic is always trying to, is in trying things that might fail. Love that. And this is a beautifully edited movie too, by the way. Um, talking about empathy, this idea of rooting for this character, I guess to talk about your character, I want to ask you first, and then Jamie, actors have said it before, you can't judge your characters. Is that, I mean, I don't want to put words in your mouth. Maybe you do. I don't think this is a very nice person. I don't think this is a very good guy. So you as an actor, for any role that is any moral gray area, do you approach it from a place of empathy? Do you approach it from a place of compassion? Um, I can't, you know, I, I, I don't, I, I don't lo lo really look at it um, like that. I think, um, I think everybody has value and everybody has a story to tell. And I certainly have seen with my own kids um, the importance of, uh, or the the impact of trauma, um, and how that can dramatically change people's lives. I guess I do believe in in evil, like in really evil. I think it's it's fairly rare, but um, I, I think the more interesting thing to explore in the story is really is clearly um, Lily's character, Leah. Um, but in order to build Tom, you have to appreciate that. He clearly has a backstory that is not, um, you know, he wasn't afforded um, the privileges in life that I hope my children have. For me, it was just most important to, like when I was writing, be in her perspective. And the whole film is told 
from her perspective. And so I wanted, you know, I feel like I wasn't judging him. I saw all the good in him that she saw. I kind of, as I was writing, had to like fall in love with his character myself, as crazy as that sounds. But um, yeah, so I, of course, there's moments to be judged, but that wasn't um, the approach I took. How similar is that to your other writing experiences? This idea of, I love the idea of putting yourself in the character's shoes, falling in love with another character. That's fascinating. I mean, so far what I have written, I feel like I have been pretty grounded in my protagonist's perspective, but this was like to an extreme. You know, I really wanted people to um, understand how she got here. You know, I, it was like a fear of mine that people were going to be like, you know, how could she have ignored these red flags? How, you know, and so I just really wanted um, you to understand her perspective. And um, that's in the way we, you know, the writing, that's in the way it's shot, that's in the way it's cut. I feel like the last, I feel like I might have said this the last time I was here, which was a few years ago, but um, it speaks to your question about um, empathy and compassion and um, when building characters, particularly ones that aren't wholly appealing. Um, and there's this wonderful coach named John Markland, who's a protege of Sandra Seacat, who just passed away. And Sandra was an extraordinary, extraordinary woman who um, really pioneered this idea of um, dream work and sort of Jungian um, approach to acting. And when you think about a dream, um, you know, everybody in the dream is a reflection of you. They're not the actual people in your dream. They're your subconscious, and they're reflecting something, and they're all connected because it's all you, right? So when you look at a script, and I remember doing this early on with this project, I mean, with everything, but particularly with this in this in, in, in speaking to your question, which is, um, you know, Leah's insecurities and her hopes, <coughs> hopes and her... Um, personal failings and public persona wants are all, you know, also the same as Tom's. They're all connected. So, you 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 know, all of these strings are pulling and pushing at the same time. And if you're an actor and you're approaching the script, simply looking at your character, you're, you're, doing, you're doing yourself a disservice because all of the other characters' journeys um, have something to offer your character. And when you explore it like a dream, um, the script itself offers up so much and your job as the actor is to interpret the writer's subconscious. So the writer sometimes doesn't even appreciate the connections that she's writing or that she's using or employing or discovering or laying out in the script. And that's what your hope, you know, that's that's like our work. That is so cool. And I feel I feel like I've heard some actors say they'll only read the scenes that their character is in and they'll only read lines about their character, but you're saying the opposite has to be true. You have to read the whole script. You have to immerse yourself, get into the writer's perspective. And I, I, as you said, this story is told from her perspective. You're a supporter in this story. Yeah, yeah but it, uh, you don't have to. I just think you're leaving, you know, you're leaving money on the table sure. if you don't. Sure. And I, it's exciting, too, the idea that you had to um, get these guys to opposite ends of the set. And, of course, with most films, it's filmed out of order. So the big question is like, what is chemistry to you? How does it work? And I know it's the hardest question to ask, but I think that for a group of, or a, for a room full of working actors too, the other way of asking the question is like, what do you look for in an audition? What makes you want to cast an actor? I mean, this was a very particular casting um, journey. You know, I wanted uh, Lily, who plays Leah, had never um, been in a film before. And uh, it was really important. That was important to me. I wanted to discover somebody new. It was exciting to me. Um, I wanted people to be able to get lost in her performance and be and feel like they were watching a real teenager as opposed to their so-and-so playing this teenager. Also, I'm personally, I'm bothered when I see like a 25-year-old actor playing a high schooler, you know, in film and TV. So I really wanted her to look young as well. So um, this, so this casting um, experience was, you know, I mean, I believed in it, but quite frankly, it was like taking a risk on somebody because it made getting the film financed much harder, but I didn't care. I, it just was, you know, what I wanted. And then I wanted to pair her with a veteran actor like Jonathan, I thought that was going to lend itself to the power dynamics at play in the film, 
and um, I think it did. Um, I mean, of course, Lily was this brilliant actor, so that's not what I'm saying, but, you know, they just had different experience levels. And, um, and yeah, in terms of chemistry, I don't know. We just, a lot of how this film, a lot of what you see on screen, I think, resulted in the time we all just spent together, getting really comfortable, um, you know, just hanging out, getting meals together, being on a group text, you know, that's really... Um, I don't think that serves you wholly. I mean, we did all of that, but there's so much deliberation. I mean, the you know that the remarkable thing about Jamie um, is to think that this was a story that she had been living with since 2016 or 17. The short comes out in 2018. We don't shoot till 2021. Um, you know, the, the short goes to Berlin. There's all the editing. I mean, this is a protracted process. So. Um, yeah, we had a great time and we spent, you know, time together, but, and, and she did, tr you know, a world-class non-parel job of, 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 of getting the cast to have chemistry, but this is, um, highly deliberate. Both writing and directing for sure. And you mentioned the kind of big swings and her guardrails. How different was each take? I mean, I would. I haven't thought of, about this in a while, and it's been a minute since we shot. But and I and since I was editing it, but um, I think it depended on the scene. You know, some scenes we were maybe more um, working in the same space, and other times, like it excites me. To, like I'm not obsessed with like you have to do it just like it's written in the script. It it excites me to kind of try it different ways, and I think it excites you as well. And I feel like there were times where we just like. We would do one, we would do a few takes that were from the script. We'd do a few takes where you did what you wanted. Like it was, um, yeah. I think it really reveals the director's um, um, talent and their faith in, in, their, in, their, in their talent. Um, because when you work with somebody who is scared of being found out as not as talented as they purport to be, then they want to control everything and they want everything to be exactly the way they say um, without looking to take into account all of the people that are trying to help and have something to offer from, you know, from the grip and electric team who might see something exciting um, to the hair, makeup, and wardrobe, and production design, and actors. So when you have somebody who's fearless, like Jamie, um, it says a lot about her, but particularly her faith in her own, in the work that she's already done and the talent that she has to offer. Um, and I might want to get a little technical here if you guys will if you guys will go with me on this but wide shots versus close-ups for this movie I felt that there must have been some kind of policy again I don't want to put words in your mouth but I felt like this wide shot is very deliberate this close-up is very deliberate this cut from wide to close is very deliberate how did you talk about that with the actors again how much experimentation was there with that were there certain shots are in close-up but then you and then you go back like the shots I would say were fairly planned out um both the short and the feature stem from a series of 35 millimeter film photographs that I had been taking in Southern California and I feel like my instinct is at least for those photographs were um kind of wider frames and so any of the like locations that excited me um or landscapes were a bit wider. Um, I wanted, you know, the title of the film, like this this movie is also about the world that she lives in, and so I wanted to show that. And then close-ups, I mean, I feel like we're really just close on their faces in very um, kind of intense moments where I want you to feel something. And is it also true that sometimes f going from wide to close, there's a question of of avoiding the nudity in this? Um, yeah, so in terms of the scene that you must be talking about, um, the scene uh, that, you know, is in a wide for quite a bit of time and then we're close on her face. I, yeah, I mean, I did feel like I was avoiding nudity. This is a film about somebody being exploited. I didn't want to exploit them further. So, um, so yes, I definitely was not um, planning to show nudity. Because I felt that as an audience member, I almost sensed that this is 
this is being respectful and I don't want to, I don't want to see the nudity. Yeah. So I'm glad that I'm there on that journey and I'm not being shown that. Right. Yeah. And it was so funny cause I, I never wanted people to think that I was afraid to show the nudity. It was quite the opposite. I, I did not want to. How much do you think about audience reaction? I mean, how much are you, I guess as a director, you're just constantly thinking about what the audience is seeing or how, how you want them to see it. But I think you have to have a little bit of both. Um, like on one hand, you have to make your art and not care what anyone's going to think. And it doesn't matter how hard it is to get your film made or people tell, you know, a hundred people say no to financing it. Like it, you have to just make your art and believe in it. But then, yeah, you also, I, for me, I do think about the audience. You got to sell it too. Yeah. There's a commerce side of the art and commerce, unfortunately. But as far as wide versus uh, just in general for you, the actor, do you take different approaches to wide versus close? Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah, you need to. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, people need to see what you're doing in a wide shot physically. Um, and uh, so it's helpful to be able to know what reads with certain distances and certain lens sizes. Um, but um, I do think once you have got your intentions as an actor and you know exactly what the essence of the scene is, then everything else around that and getting there, that journey to, um, to that is totally... Um, uh, the, that's the exciting ride because you have you know, once once they say action, you're like you're ripping the ticket, you're off, and and you've you God willing, you don't know exactly how you're going to get there, even though you've got this guidebook, you know. Um, the um, the only thing I think, and this, I wouldn't wouldn't say this at any other Q and A, but with actors, is that the only thing to really be conscious of, which is helpful when you do stage work which you sh I hope everybody's doing or does and actively continues to be in a class and be on stage in front of other people is simply to like, um, you know, understand your blocking because what you never want to do is have these extraordinary moments not just be seen by camera. And it's intuitive in us as human beings and particularly as vulnerable people like actors to not want to really face the crowd and in this case, the camera, and you need to turn into the camera. If you've ever seen people at Video Village looking at an actor who's doing this and they're like weeping, and they, like, they're like, go, 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 go. you're just like, oh my God, this is so great. I just want to see it. So not being stingy with that is so important. And um, that's the only time I think it's really critical for actors to think about how they're going to be received is <clears throat> simply... There is a camera here. You need to really give the camera as much of yourself and the performance and the work as possible. It's almost like that's also the art and commerce. You can't just have art where you're crying down like this. You also have to sell it out. Yeah, and it becomes intuitive. I mean, that's <laughs> the practice. thing about, that's what I'm saying. With pra Yeah, if you're in, you know, I don't care how much you're working in film or TV, like get up and do a scene in a class or being a, you know, cause then you start to really build that habit of just knowing how to, and to feel comfortable looking at that camera and, and, and feeling comfortable then with the relationship that you have with your cameraman. Cause that's a really wonderful relationship and it's so important to your work in many ways. Um, in, 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 and in many scenes, they're like dance partners. So the better you get to know them, the better they understand your habits and the faith that they have, um, or that they th that the faith that the camera operator will have that hi you'll find them as much as they'll find you. Oh, well, that's really when when they catch some magnificent work. Wonderful. And can I kind of put you on the spot? You mentioned that you had only seen this film once. Is that true? I th th did we sit through it in Deauville? I can't remember. I don't think we did. No. So yeah, so once. It was, you, an, it was an, it was, it was How do you feel about watching your own work? <laughs> I don't mind watching my own oh, work. Okay. This movie was like, this is my 30th year in SAG. Um, and, um, yeah. Again, not, I would not say this at another panel. This is my 30th yeah, yeah. year in SAG. Cool. And, um, and I'm very grateful to the union. I really am now as a parent, um, and as a husband, um, there are these things that I never took into account that have been extraordinary. Um, and I'm really grateful to the, the SAG-AFTRA team that have taken such good fiduciary care of um, 
uh, you know, of our of our funds. Uh, but in the 30 years uh, of working, I've never been so uncomfortable with anything that I've ever been in as I have with this. And uh, I always, even even when we come to the Q&As, I'm always like, I feel so uncomfortable for you guys because you're just coming out of this thing. Yeah. And it's so, it's, it's so, it can be so painful. Uh, and it's painful to play uh, a character like this to see him realized on screen. I really didn't know if Jonathan was ever going to talk to me again after he saw this movie. That was a tough week. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah the yeah. first uh, time, yeah. yeah. Well, there's only, you know, I mean, going back to uh, the empathy that one has for a character, you know, to Jamie's um, credit again, there's only a few scenes here where he's not charming. Um, it's like a CSI episode where you think it's a super high tech show and you're like, but there's really only two VFX shocks in the whole 42 minutes, right? Like it's, there's not, th this movie is not a movie filled with trauma or sexual violence or, um, you know, or rape, but there's a few minutes, there's a few scenes, there's a few moments and they just cut you, you know? So... The experience of making the movie was really quite joyful, except for a few scenes or a few moments. Um, some of the pre-production was probably a little challenging emotionally, but it's really as an audience member that I felt as much pain as maybe um, you guys experienced. It's a very different movie, second viewing, of course, as opposed to first. Um, intimacy coordinators, I want to ask just the, you know, what's the 101? What do people need to know about working with intimacy coordinators, both as a director and then as an actor? So uh, I've only done it this one time in this film, so I'll speak to this experience. Um, again, what I found to be most important more than any th of the work with the intimacy coordinator was w the conversations between me, Jonathan, and Lily, and just making it very clear that there were open lines of communication and we had to all be very open and honest and trusting. And so it really was about the three of us first and foremost. But I remember you said something um, that like an intimacy coordinator is kind of like a stunt coordinator. They have all the things you need. They have the modesty garments. They have whatever you need. But then, and they kind of like tell you what they have. And, but then they go sit and, you know, wait if you need them. Like they're not really, yeah, they're not, they're not directing the movie ultimately. So they're kind of just there if you need them. And it's your gig, even though they're kind of a presence, a comforting presence in the room. Or an, my an opinion is the... that a good intimacy coordinator is just there if you need them. Sure. And as, yeah. And as an actor, is it in terms of that versus stunt coordination? I mean, is it similar? Oh yeah, yeah. I think it is. There, look, there's really terrible stunt coordinators, and there's really great um, stunt coordinators. Um, it's an it. I have done uh, uh, my my initial thought around intimacy coordinators when I when they first came up. Now for me, like maybe three, three and a half, maybe four years ago, <clears throat> um, was like this is totally unnecessary and it's going to get in the way of the relationship between the director and the actors, and is just totally unnecessary. I've been doing sex scenes since Sleepers in 1995. You know, I was being groomed then, but now I'm now I'm doing the grooming, which is not a funny joke. Um, but I have had a lot of experience with nudity and a lot of experience with sex scenes, more than um, a lot of my my friends, um, my colleagues. I don't know, um, and. Uh, I r recognize that the way in which I've conducted myself on set and the kind of process that I laid out very early on, which included a lot of things behind the actress's um, back, you know, to make sure that she had a hair makeup person that was, I said, you, you know, make sure you go talk to her and make sure she feels comfortable making sure there's another female crew member that was available so that if the actress didn't want to say something to me or to the first or the director that she had somebody she could say something to and we'd have kind of a, a, a language that we could communicate so that the actress didn't feel uncomfortable. I'd always talk to the actress directly about what, what was okay and what's not okay and explain like I understand that there can be trauma in any part of your body and if you feel uncomfortable on the day we'll change that too and then um, I mean, I have a whole system here and making sure that I had that conversation with somebody else, with them present, and so on and so forth. But then I was like, well, but like, there's a lot of sex scenes going on and not everybody does that. And it's totally, totally, totally appropriate to make sure that there's somebody who just sets a standard. Um, when, when, and then there's a whole insurance issue. Like, 
I want somebody who's there so that I don't have, why would I, why should an actor have be having to put together this like system to make everybody feel comfortable? That's not my responsibility. I, I mean, it is and it isn't. It, it, it is and it isn't. Um, I want the most comfortable set in the world because like the scenes soar when they're, everybody's feeling comfortable and good. And you want to be able to have the same sense of spontaneity with somebody in a sexual scene that you have in a regular scene. There shouldn't be. Um, so you want to have things that are scored and prescribed and clearly directed. And then um, you want to make sure what you know what the grounds are and, and what you can't do and, and so on and so forth. So it's it's a slightly um, more nuanced answer. Um, but yeah, they're critical and there's some really bad ones and I've worked with them. And they're trying to direct and they're trying to make everyone feel really uncomfortable and make a mountain out of a molehill. And I've worked with some wonderful ones that, you know, just provide the sort of assurance that is, um, I think, necessary. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for your can't. Thank you for keeping it real because it's true. Every department has people that are not. They've good only been job. doing this for four years. What do you, I mean, come on. That's very true. It's I mean, a, this it's, is we're figuring it out. COVID so. coordinators, too. It's even even smaller of a of a time period that people are. Well, I hope that we continue to have intimacy Maybe coordinators and that we don't continue to have COVID coordinators. There God go. willing, we'll move up. We'll move on from <laughs> totally. the, the pandemic. Um, and I just want to say, I hope that films like this, where so many of the people behind the camera are women for this kind of subject matter, is less and less of a rarity, right? Is it safe to say it still <laughs> is a rarity, unfortunately? I feel like the tides are turning on this. Maybe slowly, but I'm not, I mean, I'm not an expert on, on that. You're I, helping pave the way. Thank you. <laughs> um, I have to wrap soon. Obviously, I have to ask the advice question. You mentioned sleepers. You've been doing this a long time, this, this whole business. What's the advice? What's the best piece of advice, especially maybe that you got really early in your career that has guided you? Well, I, I, I think what the things I say to my kids, um, we do hard things. Um, slow is smooth and smooth is fast. You can do anything as long as you breathe. And um, when you fall down, you get back up. You had that so ready to go. I say it to them every day. The other one is Beautiful. honor, fairness, kindness, and truth. You know, it's a long game, so don't take shortcuts. Beautiful. And do you have a piece of advice that has been guiding you? Yeah, I mean, this is more, actually, I was going to say this is more for, you know, me as a director, but it's it. I think it applies to actors, too. Another filmmaker once said to me, you have to be kind of naive to be a filmmaker in the sense like you have to believe like I just had to be completely naive and like believe I was going to make a film and like believe that my film was going to get made. And I think it's the same as an actor. You have to believe you're going to be an actor. Um, Don't ever think and be in the moment and all of that good stuff. Is there any um, any bad advice that you've received? What's a piece of advice no, you wish you had? Ones, people, you know, be, there's always there's always some there's always like an easier route, you know, and you kind of like th can think you can get away with it, but you know, you really can't. Like all of the tricks and stuff, like there's no tricks. Um, you got to learn your lines, you know. Like I love acting; I hate learning lines. But like you know, the freedom you have when you do the work, that's intoxicating. This idea that you have to love everything that you do, I think that's a that's a real farce. You don't have to. You have to love the result, right, of what you are trying to do. And when you're totally relaxed and you're breathing and you've done the work and you've prepared the character and you've learned the lines and you understand the relationships and you've done all of it, some of that, some of those processes are not fun. Like some of it's not fun. Some of it's totally fun. But what's intoxicating? I mean, what's just what will keep you paying SAG dues for a long time is the joy that we all, all of us as actors feel when you stand on stage or they say action. I mean, it's just the most, it's just the best, right? I mean, it's just the best and it doesn't dissipate. I really appreciate that that's, it's not all sunshine and daisies all the time. And in fact, if it's not satisfying, if it were easy, if it, if it, if it weren't challenging, right? Well, I would take less challenging. I'm <laughs> I've, I've been, had years of unemployment. I've had financial stress. I mean, you know, it's been, it's been a ride. But um, when you get to, you know, and this is true, like, you know, when you get to work with somebody like Jamie and you know that she's the real deal and then you start shooting and she's the real deal and then she cuts it and the movie's extraordinary and it's the real deal, and you're like, oh, maybe my intuition is good. Like maybe, 
you know, maybe uh, I'm, my compass is right. That's that's the um, that's that's the real that's the real thrill. That's what keeps you going. Yeah, wonderful, Jamie, Jonathan. Thank you guys so much. Could you guys give them a hand? <laughs>